myself because I know. Come here, come here. This is too gross. This, this, is, is, this is amazing out here. Hi, Beanie. <laughs> naked baby, naked baby. I think she's the only baby to pee in the Concord. That was amazing. I love that story. Did, oh, you missed it. She farted really loud out here. And we all laughed and clapped, and she thought it was really funny. Oh. Okay, sit here for a second. Be naked. Daddy! Sit there and be naked. Tell Daddy to come here. I'm sorry, Tell da Janet, will you get Daddy? Look at him. Hi, everybody. Hi, <laughs> Daddy. Hi, everybody. Hi, standing up walking girl with your little young Hi, friends. everybody. I'm free. Oh, Francis. Hi. Francis. Where's Daddy? Will you get Daddy? Okay. I think the joke's... I think the joke's... <laughs> I had a joke. That was great. But I she's going to pee any yeah, second. Really I just want a shot of her by herself, though. I just don't want to be in the shot. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I just want to grab your little boob. That's all. Yeah, you want to grab her. Okay. Play with the legs. Okay. Oh, yeah, nice tight uh, shot of her face. Not a smoke. Nice tight shot of her face. Okay. Come on, try some. Mm, try some. Mm. <laughs> like, here, eat the sweets. <laughs> Come on, Francis, once you do this, you won't ever not want to. Kurt, make her have a little tiny taste. She thinks it's medicine. I know she does. Because it comes from a spoon, right? Now, now. That is good. There's no mm -hmm. anything. Mm. You got That's it now. That's a lot, Kurt. It's a lot. That's a lot. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Kurt. Come on. No, but he was, I guess, after doing a ton of stuff with the Pixies, finally wore them one time, and he said, I'll never go back now, because it's so easy, and he wears them in shows, and... Once you go Frank Black, you never go back. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you know, you know this is for a, a half-hour special, <coughs> right? so it's sort of, there's a lot of old stuff and history of the band stuff that you probably talked about a lot before, but it's mm -hmm. for this all-inclusive thing, so... Right, well, we offered to... Um, contribute some of um, our old stuff that's going to be in our home video for it because it would be kind of boring without some really old footage, yeah, you know. That, uh, that'll, uh, thank you. Uh, oh, sure. That, that'll be great. I know, I don't, um, I know I, I had pictured using music from Bleach and, and getting this montage of photos and album. And right, and that would look really together. cheesy. Yeah, so, Just yeah, photos. That'll, that'll be really cool. Um, so I guess starting at the beginning, um, can you talk about what, what kind of town Aberdeen is and what it was like growing up there? And what kind of town is Aberdeen? It's a, it's a coastal logging town in Washington State, and it's um, really secluded. And it's um, about 200 miles away from Seattle, which is the only really large city in, in Washington State. And... Um, Olympia is about in, you know halfway in between those two towns, and the, Olympia has a little bit of culture, and that's that. I went to that place more than I went to almost any other place during my youth to to seek out punk rock and a lot of other types of music, live music. What was what was it like growing up there? This is a kid. Was it kind of boring and, and hard to grow up there because there wasn't much to do, or you probably had to invent your own. To do, to yeah, well, we invented our own amusement. We um, vandalized, skipped school, smoked pot, smoked cigarettes, um, and that's about it. <laughs> Listen to music. There, there. Um, the local record store only had top forty music. The local radio station only played top forty music. So, I mean, we were pretty much just stuck with whatever was our was was there in Aberdeen, you know? Do you think that's why, I mean, a lot of, aside from, I mean, the obvious way Nirvana sounds, you've, you've got a real pop sensibility. Do you think that's where that came from? Or what, what kind of, was it your mom listening to stuff? Or what do you think you heard first that might have had a subconscious? Mm -hmm. Well, my parents were never music lovers. I, I don't recall my mom ever really owning any albums besides John Denver's greatest hits 
Is that the greatest hits album where he's going like this with his hat on, hand on his hat, like this, going, is that the greatest hits album? Or, or just one of his popular records, I don't know. But that's about it. That and, um, and just Top 40 Radio, you know, Seasons in the Sun, really white bread, white pop music, you know. Do you, do you think that's what kind of seeped through, or do you hope it was maybe something better than that sort of? Well, it must have seeped through. I mean, it must have had an effect on us. Yeah. Do you think, um, I mean, if, if you had lived in, in the, the utopian suburban neighborhood and maybe had the, the, the typical family and, and you know, the, the Cosby Show upbringing, do you think you, you still would have picked up a guitar and wanted to do what you're doing? Now, or? The utopian neighborhood? <laughs> if, you mean if I lived with Dr. Huxtable? Yeah, probably. I think so. My my father one time, a few years ago, he wrote me a letter and he said, I would like, in some, in one way or another, he, he said, it, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, living in an oppressed town, you know, you wouldn't have had, you wouldn't have had the um, incentive to really go out and, and, and prove something to anyone. And he likes to take credit for that, for bringing me in, you know, bringing me up in a small town, but um, no. I'm sure I would have looked for punk rock and it, it just would have been easier for me and I would have gotten into it at an earlier age, you know, and I just would have, you know, I mean, I just think there's a, a breed of people who really honestly like music and there aren't very many of them really, you know, and those, usually, those are the people who usually become musicians, you know, and uh, it doesn't really matter what environment you grow up in, you know, it's just, you know, some environments are more restrictive than others. So it was, um, I guess it was Buzz that you heard for the first time, right? Or was it before that? Had you had any exposure to him before? That? No, that was um, about the time. Yeah, he made a compilation tape for me. I was going, um, I was commuting back and forth between Aberdeen and Montesano. I was living in Aberdeen. And I was um, going to school in Montesano, which is about 30 miles away. And um, I had Buzz in a couple of classes. I had him in an art class and an electronics class. And I remember just uh, hanging out with him. And just uh, he had a few punk rock magazines. And I would look at them and just like, oh, I was just mesmerized, you know. I was just like, oh, God, what would that sound like? And finally one day I convinced him to make me a tape. And, so you were a long time wondering about what it would be like before you actually heard it then? Oh, for years. Ever since I was like 12, like that issue of Cream Magazine when they were following the Sex Pistols tour, you know, in 78. You know, I, just, I remember seeing that picture of Sid Vicious and just going, oh, wow, that's real rock and roll. It has to be. Look at the blood on his face, you know? <laughs> what were you, um, I guess, living there and not actually being able to hear it before that? What were you, I mean, I'm sure you had favorite bands before. You actually that. Typical, mm, typical um, stuff, you know, I, I was first, probably the first band that I was really into was the Beatles, and then all that Top 40 radio, and then after that, um, when I was about fourth grade, I was living with my father in Montesano, <laughs> and um, I just, I, what was it, he had a record club. You know, one of those Columbia House record clubs, you know. And one of his friends, he was a bachelor. He was a, a fresh, you know, he'd just recently gotten divorced and he was a bachelor. So one of his bachelor friends told him to um, get, a, get, a, get one of those uh, subscriptions. And he didn't even open them up. He didn't even open up half the records that came. And they were just sitting there, you know, in the plastic steel. And one day I opened them all up and there was some great music, you know. Finally, I got to hear Black Sabbath, you know, the harder stuff that they wouldn't have played in Aberdeen or on the radio in Montesano or Aberdeen, you know. So I, I, I was just like, you know, instantly a rock and roll fan, you know, a harder rock and roll fan. Did, um, do you think, I mean, thinking back to when, when you're a kid and every week, what you want to, what you want to do when you grow up changes. Do, do you remember what you wanted to do before you, you got your first guitar? And... Um, yeah. I wanted to be a, um, a stunt person. I wanted to be Evil Knievel first. Uh, I used to like, I would like, well, I remember one time I took a piece of metal and taped it to my chest and 
put a bunch of firecrackers, I taped a bunch of firecrackers on that piece of metal and put my shirt over it and lit myself on fire and jumped off the roof and stuff like that. I would take all the bedding out, put it on the deck and jump off the roof, take my bike off of it and stuff like that, you know, but then I hurt myself too much. And then, um, but at a really early age, I wanted to be a rock and roll star. I wanted to play drums, you know, ever since I got my first Beatles record, I wanted to play drums in a band. I wanted to have the adoration of, of John Lennon, but have the anonymity of anonymity of, of Ringo Starr, you know? I didn't want to be a front man. I just wanted to be back there, but, you know, be a rock and roll star at the same time. Eventually that happened, though. I mean, are you, are you comfortable with that now? Or does that feeling still kind of hold true? I'd still rather be a rhythm guitar player. Yeah, or a drummer, but I just don't have a good rhythm. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm a really bad drummer, but I love to play drums. And I joined, I was in high school and junior high. No, actually it started in grade school. Whoops. I, um, let me start that over. I, I was in a grade school band and I played snare drum for years and it went up until high school. I never learned how to read music either. I always faked my way through it. I would watch the kid in first chair, you know, I would watch him figure out the piece and then I would copy him. <laughs> Is that, so I mean, it, but obviously being being a songwriter though, wouldn't you feel weird about like, say if you, if you were, I mean Pete Townsend did sing, but if you were Pete Townsend or someone like that and you, you wrote most of the songs that your band was doing and someone else was singing them, wouldn't that be kind of weird? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, as long as I got the credit for it. If I wrote a song, I'd like to get the credit for it, but then it's all you have to do is look on the insert of an album and it says your name on it, you know. But, um, no, at an early age, for a long time, I really did want to be someone in the background, a rhythm guitar player or a drummer, you know. I didn't want all the limelight because even if you're not a songwriter, you know, the lead singer always gets everything, you know. They get all the attention and everything, you know. So, and I would, I still to this day would much prefer that, really. Um, can you tell us about when, when you and Chris first met? Is it, is it true it, it took a while for you to, to get him involved in doing something? Were you trying to get him to, to play with you for a while? Yeah, for a long time. I knew him for at least three years before we started playing seriously in a band together. But we had like side bands with Buzz and the Melvins, other members of the Melvins and friends of ours in that area. We, we got together and played in a few bands like the Stiff Woodies. We'd play at local jock kegs, you know. We'd, we'd put Knox gel in our hair and like GBH and go to, and play live music at these, at these uh, shows. And I mean, at these parties and it was great, you know. We freaked everybody out. But everyone was so drunk that they didn't care about our appearance. They just wanted live music, you know. It's better to try as hard as you could to piss the rednecks off. Yeah, and get free beer. Yeah. Um, so... I'm condoning drugs, aren't I? Sorry. Smoking. Yeah, we smoke pot. It's so great. It is, too. I remember seeing that in my high school locker gym. Alcohol is a drug too. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to go make, make money off of it. So, um, so what, what was it that um, that finally made you? I mean, I guess which is Chris didn't want to be in a band, right? I don't think he ever really had very many aspirations to be in a band, really. He just liked playing guitar. I knew he had a guitar for years. But um, Dale Crover, the drummer for the Melvins, and I made a demo in like 85, late 85, and um, at my aunt's house on a four track. And uh, I had had the tape for about a year or so. And I was always trying to push it on my friends, you know, to try to get them into starting a band with me. And one day Chris, after probably hearing it a few times, just decided, hey, this, this is pretty good, you know. So finally the hint worked, you know. Was that just, um, I was asking Chris about this earlier, he wasn't sure, was that, did you play bass on that as well or was it just guitar and drums and that was it? I played a little bit of bass on it yeah. and Dale played bass on the other parts, on some of the other songs. Was that, that was Fecal Matter, right? Yeah. Was that? yeah. Okay. Um, 
That was my band, my imaginary band. Yeah. Um, do you remember the first time you played together? Did it, did it click right away, or is it? I mean, I guess just because you had similar tastes in music, it might have. But. I think it clicked in a way where just the fact that we were actually playing music, and I heard these songs with a full band for the first time. It was just so amazing, you know, to actually play to I mean I'd heard these songs because they were recorded but they're all the all the instruments were dubbed you know and to play them live in a room you know it was, it was amazing it was like the most incredible thing I've ever done and I'd been wanting to do it for years you know I mean I was like six years overdue of trying to, of already had a, having a guitar and wanting to play with other people but I could never get anything past like some guy that plays drums and he'd bring his drum set over to my house and I'd start playing this raunchy music and they'd leave, you know. I could never get anyone to stay more than a day or a few hours. <laughs> was he was he playing in the way you pictured them being played or, was, or did he just add something more to it that he liked even better or how was it, what was your first reaction to him playing? To his playing? Um, basically played the same notes that were on the tape already. We just, we basically just played the songs that were on the tape, on the fecal matter tape. So, yeah. I mean, he's added stuff, he's added his own style to the band now since we've started writing songs together. But initially we were, we were just playing those songs off that tape. What was the first thing you did together? Was it Hairspray Queen? Or that, did he actually, I mean, it went from beginning with oh, the first song that we wrote together? Yeah. Ooh, God, I don't know. I um, it, it could have been, yeah. But even at that time, when we first started writing songs, I would come up with the, with the bass lines and everything. I would show everyone what to play, because I was still writing songs, you know, on my own time. And um, but that was probably one of the first songs that I had written at that time, and and we started to practice with as a band. Um, do you have any memories of, uh, of the, the first couple of gigs that you did? Oh sure. Well, there are parties. Or... Oh, the let's see. The Chris very and... first one. God, who it was a party, I think. Yeah. Well, sometimes I mean we considered. A gig, um, at, I don't know. If we played together in in the house for for a couple of hours, and if two people stop by, we consider that a gig, you know, a show to us. I mean, that was good enough. We had an audience of two people, you know, locals who hated our guts. They thought it was terrible music, you know. But the first official show we actually played was at a party, and. Um, it was way out in the woods. I can't even remember what town it was. It was somewhere in between Montesano and Aberdeen, and it was, you know, a typical kegger type of thing. And it was, it, it was pretty amazing. That was that was a fun night. It was, uh, I think it was Halloween night. We were really drunk, and we had that f some fake Halloween blood, and we smeared it all over ourselves and played our seven songs off the tape, and um, um, just. We alienated the entire crowd. The entire party moved into the into the kitchen and just just left the band. Just left us there in the front room playing our songs. <laughs> is that is that was that Aaron? Yeah, that was with Aaron Burkhart. Yeah. Um, the first single you did after you went to Sub Pop um, was was a cover. Did you have any concern? Why why did that end up being instead of one of your songs? I really don't know. <clears throat> um, I really don't have a very good answer for that, other than it was a pop song. It was one of the only palatable songs that we had. You know, at the time we were writing stuff like Hairspray Queen, and we had a lot of, I mean, even though there were a little bit of pop element in some of the songs, it, we thought that people would be able to swallow it easier. We'd get um, instant attention by that. You know, people would. It was such a catchy song, and it was so repetitive that we thought that you know people would would listen to it right away and remember it. And also, I think Bruce or John—I think it was John—suggested we 
recorded that song too. It was one of their favorite songs that we did. So you've been doing it for your Lady of Cakes already? Then? Yeah. yeah. Well, then I guess once people hear that, then they can they'll pay attention and listen to the other stuff. Then. Yeah, yeah. I guess that was the idea. I don't know. Um, so was it was it Sub Pop's idea to only do a thousand of them, or was it? Yeah, so it's, it's it was their idea. Them. It was almost a surprise to us. They might have warned us. They might have told us that th this is what they were going to do, but it was kind of a surprise um, at the time. I mean, we were just so thrilled to actually put out a single that it wasn't until after only a thousand were printed that we started to complain about it. You know, it was like, but there's more people who want to buy this thing. You know, why why not sell more? You know. It just didn't make any sense to us at the time. I mean, I understand it now, but still, I mean, if you're going to put something out, you should, you, uh, that's why we were signed to a major label. There should be, you know, everyone should listen to it if they want to, you know. Um, how long after that did Bleach come out? Was it about six or eight months? Or? <clears throat> I don't know, honestly. <laughs> It seemed like two years. It just seemed like forever. But, um, I think it was a little bit longer than eight months. I don't know. There, I'm, I think there, I think there are um, dates on the single, and there's a date on the. Well, I know. I know it was on the, the album. Year. I know it was the year following, but it's hard to kind of. Yeah. I don't know what months they came out. So, is that looking back on that? Is that? Um, I know there was. I, mean, I can't remember who told me this or where this at the time, but was there some concern? I don't know if it was on the label's part or your part or, or who's thinking it was that you had you had these songs that had pop sensibilities to them, but it, I don't know if it went into the production or whatever it was, but that someone felt like since you were on sub pop, it had to sound different from the way you wanted it to sound or something, or someone was concerned about you making a sub pop record and something that they could work with. Or who who was concerned with I that? Can't, I can't remember the details on it, but was it? Did you feel like you had to make a sub pop record for them, or did you make did you did you absolutely make the record you wanted to make, or was there some sort of feeling that not really? I've always felt that there should have been an album before Bleach, because by the time that we recorded the songs off of Bleach, um, we were really into that kind of music. I mean, we were, we don't regret it now, but at the time we should have put out the Fecal Matter tape, or at least a lot of the songs that were on Fecal Matter tape. We should have re-recorded them. You know, because that was just a period of our band. That was just part of our progression. You know, we were really into experimental, noisy, like butthole surfers kind of music. You know, and um, there's just—I mean, that's always been the case with us. We always should have put out something a little bit before the last record. You know, but um, so a lot of the stuff that ended up on Incesticide, you wish had come out before Bleach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the stuff on this site should have come out before Bleach, actually. But also, that we did feel a little bit of pressure, a little bit of intimidation by the whole Seattle scene because everyone was so heavily into this retro 70s thing. And because we were on that label, I mean, there was a, an element of that there. You know, it was like, uh, I mean, Jonathan had quite a few suggestions from what I can remember. You know, I mean, it wasn't like they demanded it. It wasn't like, you know, what a major label. I mean, I've heard of some really scary major label stories. But um, there was a little bit of major label attitude going on with Sub Pop at the time, you know. I mean, they. I remember one time Jonathan um, <clears throat> suggested I change some lyrics in one of the songs and stuff like that, you know. And I, that was just kind of weird because it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be an independent label, you know. And... You know what I mean? I mean, it's you should be able to do exactly what you want, you know. I mean, but if we weren't so spineless, we would have done it. We would have done exactly what we would wanted to do, you know. So they, had you wanted to put some of the older songs on Bleach and, and ended up just doing the new stuff on your own, or was that sort of? Um, did, I think at the write, time. Did you write new songs for Bleach. Yeah, we did write new songs for Bleach. There were a lot of songs that were just just written within the two weeks or even the last week prior to recording. You know, I mean, we at the time we had a time scheduled for for the recording of the album, and 
at that time we only had maybe six songs, you know, and during the last, during the week prior to that, we, we wrote a whole bunch of songs, you know, and um, we just, uh, I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to say. We, um, I, mean, I, I guess my question is why the songs that you wrote in those two weeks made it on and not the older ones. Was that your decision? Or? Yeah. No, I guess is what I'm trying to say is that we, we wrote so many songs in that week right before we recorded that we, we, were, we were excited about the new songs. So we wanted to record them. But initially we wanted to just record a f the few new songs that we had and re-record -re most of the stuff that was on the Fecal Matter tape. And that would have been the album. You know, it would have been a lot more like Incessicide, but we just happened to write so many new songs, you know, that we put, just put it on Bleach. And they just happened to have been more in the 70s vein, you know. Yeah. Um, do you ever have any memories of that tour? Like, I mean, I, I know I've heard some hell stories of the, uh, the Mud Honey tour over in Europe and stuff, about what was going on, just equipment breaking down all the time and 20 of you crammed in a van, no money. Is that pretty much the case for the whole thing in America as well? Yeah, I can't say it was worse, but it was, yeah, it was probably about the same because we chose to tour in the middle of the summer <laughs> in the south, you know. Imagine being in Texas in July, you know, packed packed up to the rim of the van with t-shirts and equipment with four members, you know, with no air conditioning, you know, tooling around, living off of $30 a day if you're lucky, you know. It's, it was fun, but we should have we should have been a little bit more smart about it, you know. We we should have toured in September or something, you know. But we were so excited about put you know, getting the record out and going on tour that we just went for it. Yeah. Was it um was it any better time for tape change? Okay. It's weird because I, <laughs> I produce 120 minutes, but I don't really hear about videos or see them until they're cleared through standards and accepted and everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was I always wondered if they ever submitted stuff that got rejected or anything like that, or, or if they just never bothered submitting anything. I think they did. Did they? Yeah. There's so many. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll talk to people later. Oh, why aren't you playing this video? And I'll go. Because, well, for the most part, I think it was because it's so low budget. You know. All the other videos they've done have been really, you know, cheap, super eight. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. It's a good song. I don't know. I don't, I don't sit on the music game, so I don't get really into that. Um, oh, yeah, the, um, with um, Ted in Europe, was that any better or pretty much the same story as when you were in the tour in the US? Just well. Like, you have a lot of equipment problems and stuff. Or? Um, Chris was telling me, you were always like masking, duct taping stuff together yeah. before a show and stuff. And I mean, being in Europe for the first time was more romantic, you know. It wasn't any more comfortable. We were living off of deli trays and, you know, cigarettes and bad beer, or strong beer, I should say. I guess you'd call that good beer, wouldn't you? I don't, I don't like beer. But, um, I don't know. It was, um, there were 11 people in a small European Euro van. The seats were at this angle. So you would try to sleep, and we'd be on like, you know, 15 to 18 hour drives like this, just crammed up against one another in the dead of winter, you know. It was, it was fun, you know, but after a while, I mean, after seven weeks, it took its toll on everyone, you know. So. Did you not want to talk to those guys for a couple of weeks after that, probably? Or? Well, I don't think we spoke for months. <laughs> I don't know. I, I actually don't remember. I think we may have played a few shows after that, within that year, together. We were always playing shows together. I guess probably after that winded down is when, is that when Sub Pop started talking to some majors about the distribution deal they were going to do that you guys weren't crazy about being involved with? Was that, was that part of the reason for leaving, or...? It was part of the reason, yeah. I mean, I can't say that we weren't um, th 
you know, into the idea of being on a major label. We just didn't like the idea of someone else taking a larger percentage of, of our payments, you know. I mean, why be on a major label through another company when you can be on one yourself, you know, so. Was it, um, I guess then you started pursuing stuff yourself when you met, you met Soundgarden's manager and got a lawyer and stuff. And was that, I mean, knowing that you were going to move on to a major and stuff like that, is that kind of why you and Chris started rethinking Chad being in the band and stuff? Or was it that no, way? not at all. For, for a long time, we had, we weren't very happy with Chad's drumming, basically. Um, I mean, he has his own unique style, and it's and it's appropriate for a lot of the songs that we wrote, but not for what we really wanted to do at the time. We wanted to, we just wanted to move into more of a pop world, you know, at the time, and and it's just his style just didn't fit. Yeah. Was it was it hard when you had to go and tell him? To oh yeah, it was one of the worst days I've ever had. <laughs> it was terrible. It's, I hate firing people. It's the worst thing you can do, you know. Well, see, I mean, from all accounts that, that I've heard and, and read about and stuff, he, he, it doesn't seem like he was all that surprised or really, I mean, I guess he, it seems like he always thought it was maybe imminent that there'd be a part in his ways. I think he sensed for quite, quite a few months that we weren't yeah. totally happy with his drumming, yeah. Well, he's on, is he... He's been in a couple, one or two bands or something like that since then. He's doing something now, isn't he? I can't yeah, he's so. in um, the Red Ants. Something Ants. God, do you know? No. Shit. I, it's embarrassing not knowing his other name. His other band name. Something Ants. Fire Ants. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Chad is in another band called the Fire Ants. What what do you think happened when, when Dave joined the band? Did it did it seem like I mean obviously you were a band for a while before that, but did it, did it really seem like here we are? This is this is this, this is now it. The, we can make we can be around for a while like this and make five or six records. Or right, whatever. right. I mean, he just Dave added so much more diversity. You know, not only did he have perfect metronome timing, he hit really hard. He was able to go in between all the dynamics that we wanted to experiment with, and it was just perfect. And plus, he, you know, he sang backup vocals. So, and I've, I'd wanted that forever, ever since the beginning of the band. You know, what's always amazed me about him is he's, I mean, he's first of all one of the hardest hitters I've ever seen before. But everything he does is so distinct and sharp and clean. And then you guys, it seems like you guys get really loud a lot and then break down. And he's also really subtle. When he needs to be, and he does everything he does seems to be right on all the time. Yeah, yeah. Does he? I mean, I, I guess I guess the hard part comes from. I mean, he's he's talked about a lot of the bands that that he liked growing up, and it seems like it he, he sort of emanates all those things that he was listening to when he was growing up, which makes him, I guess, the hard hitter that he is, and, and makes it so. Yeah, he's really good at um, copying other drummers' styles. Yeah. I mean, he's he's got his own original style too, but he's all he also can play a Led Zeppelin solo, note for note, you know, perfectly. You, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, you know. Yeah, he's a great drummer. Um, did you ever feel like any of the? I mean, anyone from any of the the number of drummers you had from Chad and, and everybody else and Jason? Did did any of them really ever feel like permanent members? Like you might do this for a while with them, or Chad or Aaron? Or or even, I mean, even Dale. Well, if we could have, we would have wanted Dale to be a permanent member. Yeah. But everyone else, we always knew it wasn't quite right. Yeah. Um, now, I've heard, with what we talked about before with Bleach, did, did you feel like with Nevermind, you could finally, you could make the record you wanted to make with songs on it that you wanted to make because you pushed it a little different than Bleach? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Nevermind was definitely a, an album we wanted to make, you know. I mean, everything about that record is exactly, I mean, we have no regrets, other than maybe the production was too slick. I mean, now that I look back on it, I, I don't think it's as raw as it could have been, 
you know. And that's our fault. I can't blame it on anyone else. I can't blame it on Butch Vig, you know. I mean, he recorded the record perfectly. But, um, it's just, you know, that studios are a really, really deceiving environment, you know. They just, you, de you don't know what it's going to really sound like until you take it home and it's on, a, it's on a tape and you listen to it over and over again, you know. And at that point, after we attempted to mix Nevermind for like two weeks, it, um, we were so burnt out on it that we just didn't even care anymore. By the time we got Andy Wallace in, it was just like, oh, yeah, this is fine, <laughs> you know. Why, why was he brought in? Then do you think he just thought about everything too much in the way it sounded, or? We just, um, well, we recorded the album, then we immediately started mixing, and we were just burnt out, you know. Um, we just it, we just couldn't get it together. I don't have any explanation for it, really. It just didn't sound good. We just couldn't get it right. That sounds fine. What was it like? Um, I mean, I guess when when I talked to you guys at at Reading a couple of years ago, I think it was like two or three, two maybe three weeks before Nevermind came out. Um, so that was right before all that happened. Do you think, um, what, what, what was that like being out there with Sonic Youth? Was that pretty? I guess that was your first long tour with Dave, right? You've been to Europe once before with him? Or maybe England, just. God, I don't think so. That was the first time. Yeah. Yeah, that was the first time we went out with Dave. Mm -hmm. What was that like being out with Sonic Youth? And, you know, oh, it was incredible. Oh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, to, to be to be asked to go on tour by a band like Sonic Youth was like a dream come true, you know. I, I mean, I still can't describe what I felt, you know. It was like, wow, what an honor, you know. It was, it was great. And, and the momentum and excitement at the time was so great because everyone sensed that the album was going to do pretty well, you know. There was just a, a feeling in the air, you know, there was just like this new thing happening and no one could quite pinpoint it, but we knew that we were a part of it, you know, and we just, you know, one of the first shows we played with them was at the Reading Festival and there had been alternative bands playing the Reading Festival for the last three or four years, you know, and we didn't know anything about it, we never knew that that thing existed. and to walk out on stage in front of that many people and to realize that that many people like this kind of music it was just like wow where have we been you know we've been under a rock all these years you know but but then again you know europe is a bit different than america too i mean it's you know america's quite a few years behind it's, it seems like they really kind of i mean i guess they they were fans for a while you went on, on for a while before you went on tour then it seems like they, they really took you under their wing and sort of being on a major for the first time I guess a couple of years after they had done it they kind of it seems like they, they might have made it a little bit easier for you with the transition oh absolutely yeah they Sonic Youth has helped more bands than any band I can think of you know they, they're always they always know what's hot and new and you know I mean they just you know they, they're just really great they're really good about things like that. Did you feel a little bit a little bit better about going to DGC, knowing they had done it and Dinosaur had done it? And oh yeah, Sonic. we just basically do everything the Sonic Youth does. We just steal all their ideas, you know. <laughs> That's what we're turning into now. I mean, if, if you saw the show tonight, if you saw that last thing we did, whatever you want to call it, you know, we're turning into a, a noise guitar prog rock band, you know. I mean, that's the next step for any band, you know. It's like, but they've been doing it for years before anyone else. I mean, I honestly, I, I feel kind of burnt out with the formula that we've been doing, you know. We've been in this band for like six years, and and playing pop music can get a bit redundant. So I want to, I think we all want to start experimenting, and really the only alternative you have is to turn into Sonic Youth, you know. Such a bad thing. <laughs> No, you get, you except get, for that it's been done, but... You're going to start getting the 15 guitars with alternate tunings on all No, I don't think I could ever have the patience to do that, but... Looking back on that, does that, like I said, it was 
I'm I'm thinking for by by all calculations it was probably about two weeks before Nevermind came out. Looking looking back on that in retrospect, does it seem like a sort of calm before the storm? Uh, what? The 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 European festival. Oh, the European yeah. festival. Yeah, it must have been. Yeah. yeah, we weren't aware of it. I mean, we 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 had an idea that something was going to happen, but you know, it was a nice storm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do, you, do you remember where you were when were you still there or do you remember where you were when Smells Like Teen Spirit started getting played a lot on the radio and MTV and you knocked Michael Jackson out no we were somewhere in Europe yeah. I mean the nice the nicest thing about that tour was that we weren't aware of our stardom yeah. you know we just got reports every once in a while you know hey you guys are on the top 40 you know like really you know, we didn't even believe people for a long time, you know. We thought everyone was pulling our legs. But um, it wasn't until we got back to the States, you know. I turned on MTV and there we were, you know. Because they don't have MTV in Europe very much, in very many places, you know. So we really had no idea. So you didn't get it gradually, just all of a sudden? No, we just came home. It was like the Beatles, you know. It's like Nirvana mania, you know, stepping off the plane. There weren't a bunch of kids waiting with banners, but... <laughs> it record company before, yeah. yeah. So it, it really hit you all at once, like, your record's coming out, you're on tour with Sonic Youth, and you get back, and hey, guess what, you're a star. Yeah. 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 Were you surprised? Or, or shocked, or what was your... How, how long did it take Shock you to get used to it? is a good word. Yeah. How long did it take me to get used to it? Three years. <laughs> Here's, here's the two-part question I gave the other two guys, too. Um, what did you think of, uh, of Tori Amos' cover? Smells like it's Flattering. Yeah. Is it true um, that, that, that you and Courtney, used, for a while, used to wake up in the morning and dance around to it? Listen yeah, we used to put it on every morning and have breakfast and dance around. We'd turn it up really loud and do interpretive dancing to it. It's, it's good funny. breakfast music. Yeah. It's it's funny to listen to. The most the most ridiculous part it was on the um, the mulatto and albino part. It was, it was I'm just... mulatto. I know. <laughs> <laughs> For a while, we were using it as an opener before we came out on stage too. We would play that song and then we would come out doing dances to the song. That's hilarious. I was telling. Chris earlier that I've got, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's this EP that she put, it might have been a promotion only thing, I don't know, but and I can't remember the exact, so I drew a blank on the songs that were on it before, but it smells like Teen Spirit, I know Angie's on there, there's a Zeppelin tune, yeah, a Zeppelin the, song. the Lemon Song, or I can't the remember. Lemon Song or Tangerine, I can't remember, yeah. I don't so, think it's Tangerine, no, it might be the Lemon Song, I can't yeah. remember, but it's, it's hilarious to listen to, uh, what about Weird Al, where were you when you heard that was happening oh i laughed my ass off i thought it was one of the funniest things i ever saw uh, he he has some good people working for him i mean those people really know how to i mean i mean i'm sure he has a lot to do with it but they really know how to um reproduce things i mean to the t he had the exact same um setup you know the, it's the same video with him in it you know it's great i, th I think he directs them Really? Yeah, so I'm wow. sure, sure he's got a lot to do with it. Yeah. Like Chris told me they went to the exact same sound stage. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that must have, I mean, however much you'd absorb what, what was happening to you at that point, that must have been the sort of, you know, I mean, Chris Chris brought up that, that you guys were in Mad Magazine. This is his first thing that, his first real big indication of what had happened. But that's kind of, when you look at the other people that he's parodied, and really, I mean, you, you know, it's Michael Jackson. Yeah, yeah, huge stars. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable. Do you go along with the uh, imitation as the sincerest form of flattery thing? Sure. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Um, does it um, does it scare you or flatter you? Or what's your reaction to the whole? Um, I mean, I guess when, when the record hit big and it was getting played all over radio, there was, and I guess it's not a completely unfair thing to say, because there was a real, if you look at what happened six months or a year after that, there was a trickle-down effect from what happened from Nirvana, that from, uh, from uh, Nevermind, 
hitting big. I mean, radio, and if you look at the charts, a lot of the things that if you looked in 1991, then looked in 1992, what were the biggest Billboard album charters of the year? There was a significant difference, and you can say that's because never mind or not, but are you, I mean, you, you were called the most important man of the 90s and the voice of the, the Generation X and, and, you know, for alternative music, whatever that is, becoming mainstream. And you flattered by that or scared by that? Or? I'm not flattered by it, no. <laughs> I don't see much of a change, personally. I mean, I've said this a million times. But um, and I'm kind of tired of saying it. But I mean, we're a new wave band, and that's what happened with new wave. You know, punk rock. What punk rock was the revolution. You know, it was it was the groundbreaking thing. And then all these punk rock bands, be, you know, started making really tame, palatable music with punk rock fashion, and and it entered the mainstream, became popular for a while, and it was a fad. You know, and that's the way I look at alternative music. You know, every once in a while I'll look at the billboard charts and I just go, crap, 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 just like I always have, you know. Except for R.E.M. and, I mean, they totally deserve to be on Top 40, but um, I really can't think of any bands that are on Top 40 right now that I like, you know, personally. But, I mean, the, the, the punk bands... That, that made a difference, or the new wave bands that it is. I mean, they didn't sell nine million records worldwide. No, they didn't. They didn't you know. Because, yeah, I'm not saying we're a punk rock band, I'm saying we're a new wave band. But there were new wave bands that sold nine million copies. Yeah. You know, like The Knack and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Kaja Goo Goo, whatever, you know. That stretched a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um. Do you have any theory on, 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 on why it happened then? Or do you think it was just you guys making a really good record when things were stale and it was kind of right for the picking? That, you couldn't have said it better. Yeah. It was just the right time. It was just the right album at, at the right time, you know. I mean, I'm sure there was a collective consciousness, you know. People were just tired of Warrant, you know. Just got old. Just like... Uh, you know, grunge music will be in a couple of years, you know, if it hasn't already. You know, if we don't progress, if we don't change, if we don't take chances and do different things, you know, if we put out Nevermind 3 next year or In Utero 2, you know, it's just going to get boring with people, you know. Pop music loses their audiences all the time. I mean, it, it doesn't happen very often, you know, for a, a pop star to become famous and stay famous for years, you know, My, Madonna and Michael Jackson, and that's about it, you know. But in, in the wake of, of you guys doing really well, and whatever you think about these bands, Pearl Jam and Stone Temple Pilots, and a lot of bands that might not have done well a couple of years before, Michael Jackson and Madonna and Springsteen and a lot of bands were selling, still selling millions, but selling a lot less than they did before. And Springsteen's debuting at number three and dropping off after two weeks, and you guys are in the top ten for however long you were there, a long time. So, it, I mean, it seems, I mean... You mean when Nevermind was out? Yeah. And you have a good point that, I mean, things do come and go like that, but it, it, it's, it's not unfair to say that something really big did happen and a consciousness was, was raised. Yeah. I mean, I mean of course, it, I mean, something did happen. But I think it's just a general attitude amongst people. I don't know if it really has that much to do with music. I think it's just I think music has just been used as a tool. Um, I think a good example is um, the shows that we've been playing on this tour, you know, uh, and and just like when we went to Reading for the first time, to realize that there are that many people, that many kids our age that basically have the same views as we do and like the same kind of music you know that's a really amazing thing that's a really positive thing and and things just change all the time you know it, it, and 1990 was the year for change it was just a, something it was about time you know it was the beginning of a new decade um, five years ago I guess, well, maybe longer ago than that, when, when Nirvana actually started happening. If, if someone had asked you your 
your I don't know, your goals for what you wanted to do with the band and what you wanted to do as a songwriter and all like that. But what would you have said? Yeah. What now? If five years ago someone had said, "All right, well, you're writing songs and you're in a band, you're playing guitar and singing. What do you want to do with this?" Well, what would have been your biggest hope? Okay. Um, put out another record, yeah. or to put out a record. Yeah. I mean, the the thought of putting out a record at that time. I mean, even just five years ago, to put out a record on an independent label was really, really hard for bands. It it wasn't as common as it is now. Like anybody can put out a record. Most people use their records, actual pieces of vinyl, as demos now, just to get a deal. You know, and and that's one of the positive things about um, you know alternative music getting big, is that really obscure and and noisy bands. Are, are being signed to major labels and and the positive thing about that is that they aren't being ripped off you know at least they're getting a good advance and they can live for a couple of years you know and and they just they deserve to live comfortably you know all bands do you know if they're a good band and they put out good music and they have music out then they deserve to be paid you know the money that they deserve I mean they, they deserve to get paid the money that they they should be paid, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, it started happening like in the late 80s, you know, I mean, I, I remember knowing, I, I remember going to punk rock shows and, and bands were always, I mean, bands from out of town were getting paid $30, you know, some band from San Francisco comes up to Seattle and plays at the Gorilla Gardens, here's your 30 bucks and, you know, kiss my feet, the promoter would say, you know. And, and, you know, maybe that band sold out the Gorilla Gardens and there were 400 people there and they should have been paid what they deserve, you know, what, what, what they drew, you know. But um, it, at the time, you know, in the late 80s, all of a sudden these independent bands, you know, just started demanding more money. We're not going to play, you know. Everyone just stood up and said it was almost a revolution in a way, you know. It was really cool. I mean, we... we I remember the first time we sold out the Vogue, and that holds like a couple hundred people here in Seattle. It's a bar, and we got paid six hundred dollars. You know, three years before that, we'd have been lucky if we got thirty dollars. Yeah. You know, so. What about now? What would you um, what would you hope happens for the rest of the time you're doing this now? No, what do you mean? Well, I mean, as opposed to five years ago, but now now that you you've put out three records and. You've had the success you've had. What, what would you hope happens now? That we um, are able to sustain ourselves to to put out another really good record and, and hopefully to progress. I really want to change our style of music, you know. Um, I don't want to turn into a prog rock band, literally, but I want to, I want to do something different, really different. You know, and I want to have enough guts to do that. And, I, and if it alienates people, that's too bad. You know, but you know, the Beatles went from not to compare us to the Beatles, but the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and bands like that went from, you know, I want to hold your hand to Sgt. Pepper's. You know, that was a massive progression. You know, and I just want to experiment. Um, with all the if you don't want to talk about this, we'll just skip over it. But uh, with a lot of the the weird adjustments to the the fame that you didn't expect and all that, one of the things that made it worse was um, the trouble that Courtney had with Vanity Fair. Obviously, is that is that mercifully a closed chapter for you now, or do you think that's something that's gonna have ramifications for a while? I don't really care if it does. If people can't forget about that, you know, and just move on. I mean, we have. So, I mean, if they, if they want to remember us as the parents who supposedly gave their baby drugs, you know, fine, fuck them, you know. If, if that's all they want to think about us, then they can. They aren't music fans anyhow. The people who gossip and are concerned about things like that um, don't like our band, you know, so. And I, I'm proving that every night. I, I, I mean, I am... Every time that we play a show, I'm so grateful that there are that many kids that still like us, that, that have 
overlooked all that stuff, overlooked all the rumors and all the stupid things that were printed about us in the last two years, you know. And I can look out in the audience and I can say, these kids really like our band, and I know they genuinely like us, you know. They like our music, you know. And they don't care about what we are as people or whatever we supposedly did, you know. So that's why that's just why I'm so happy about being in this band still, you know. I wasn't happy a couple of years ago. I mean, obviously. <laughs> but just being on tour every night, it's just been great. Do you think ever looking back on that whole and this is the last thing I'll ask about this, but it, it interesting to me that just do you think looking back on that and while it was I think it's incredibly admirable how honest you were about your drug use in the past and everything else like that do you think in retrospect looking back ever that maybe you just should have fucking lied <clears throat> I did lie forever I, I tried to keep it away from everybody because I knew that I was no matter how hard I don't you know no matter how Sadly, I don't want to be a role model or influence anyone. I still do. And I knew that I was taking drugs at the time and, and there were rumors and people wanted me to talk about it, but I, I tried for months and months not to talk about it, you know. I tried as hard as I could to deny it. But um, um, there, after a while, there was just no point in it anymore, you know. I was just thought of as a big liar all the time. And, um, you know, it's not my fault. I didn't, I mean, I hardly ever went out in public when I was on drugs, and I never made a spectacle out of it. I never promoted it. And now I'm going to be associated with heroin for the rest of my life, you know. And that's not my fault, you know. I, I honestly don't think it's my fault. I think it's the journalist's fault who brought it up and, and exploited it. You know, they're the ones that have influenced a kid you know, as far as I'm concerned, because they're the ones that brought it up, you know. I mean... She was a hired gun, let's just put it that way. It's okay? Okay. How's your stomach? Did you find anything to... Ah, uh, it's gone. Yeah? Yeah. I, I finally have been prescribed the right stomach medicine after six years of being in constant pain. Uh, finally, within I haven't had a stomach problem for like over a year now. Yeah. Did they finally figure out what it was, or did they just finally? No, they never figured out what it was. I mean, most gastrointestinal doctors don't know anything about the stomach diseases. They just they just have a PhD. You know, they get paid a lot of money for pretending and prescribing you different drugs, and um, they—it's uh, a—it's a total scam, as far as I'm concerned. Because I went—I've been going to doctors for six years, and and I've tried every drug available, except for this one last one that's brand new, and it finally worked. And it—it uh, it can't be. Um, what do you call that? I mean, it isn't. What? Placebo? No. <laughs> no, it can't be, um, it isn't a s specific stomach ailment. It doesn't have a name or anything. It wasn't a matter of finding out what disease I had. It's just, it's, you know, it's psychosomatic. It's, it's part of my nervous system. It's part of, you know, there, I mean, there are millions of people all over the world who have irritable bowel syndrome. And that's, that's the common term that all doctors call a stomach problem and they just say oh you have irritable bowel syndrome but I can't fix it you know I don't have anything to fix it but you know there's just a variety of um, of ulcer medicines that can slow down ulcers you know and eventually heal them but I didn't have an ulcer I just had a red irritation in my stomach you know but I was in pain I mean I was in pain for so long that I didn't care if I was in a band, I didn't care if I was alive, you know, and it just so happened that I came to that conclusion at a time when my band became really popular, you know, I mean, it had been going on and, and building up for so many years that I was, you know, suicidal, I mean, I just didn't want to live, so I just thought, 
if I'm gonna die, if I'm gonna kill myself, I should take some drugs, you know? <laughs> May as well become a junkie, because I felt like a junkie every day, you know? You know, waking up, starving, tr forcing myself to eat, you know? Barfing it back up, it's like, you know? Just, just imagine trying to eat your three meals a day and just, just concentrating and just crying at times, just like, ugh. I'm in pain all the time, you know. And being on tour was a lot worse too, you know, it made it even worse. So when when did they how long did you know and in pain? What was it? I know you just said it before when 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 did they find the the, medic, the medicine that took you out? About a year ago. That's good. Yeah. Um I wanna go through some uh your memories from the the videos that you've made from shooting them. Um, and actually, the only thing that I've heard in any of you say anything that any kind of disappointment about any of them was smells like Teen Spirit, that not <clears throat> turn out to be exactly what you thought about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, although it worked, yeah. I mean, I liked the video overall, but it it wasn't what I pictured in my mind. When I come up with an idea for a video, I want it to be translated exactly how I see it in my mind, and it just wasn't that way. I mean, we didn't we didn't take enough time we didn't prepare ourselves enough to have as much control as we wanted to you know and um, I just remember walking in the day of the shoot and looking at the set because I you know had meetings with Sam there and um, I told him what I wanted I drew pictures of it and I walked in and it wasn't what I wanted you know it just it looked like a time life commercial to me you know with that backdrop, it just looked like it's such a contemporary, you know, you know those kind of commercials where people are sitting there, you know, trying to sell aspirin or something, or, you know, an AT and T commercial. That's what it looked like to me. It looked too contemporary, and but um, still, the kids made the video, you know, and I had to like, even after Sam had edited it, he edited it and um, sent it to me, and I didn't like it, and I flew down at the last minute to L.A. and and edited it myself. I, I threw in a few extra things, which pretty much saved it because um, I don't want to toot my own horn. But I mean, there were a lot of really, there was a lot of really good footage that wasn't used. And if a lot of that wasn't used, it would have been a really bad video. <laughs> More crowd stuff, you mean, and the kids going crazy? Yeah, the yeah. There wasn't really a lot of that, and most of the stuff that was used looked really contrived. It didn't. It would, there was no spontaneity in it, so I just threw all the spontaneous parts in. Um, and I was and then well, I guess after that, um, you did a, a, a couple with Kevin Kerslake. Um, <coughs> what was now the only? I guess the the blues and the purples and your faces being a, a, um, distorted was was the only thing you really wanted from Come As You Are. Is that true, or was it? Are the biggest things that you were concerned with? Okay. Yeah, those were the biggest things. And, um, you know, I wanted a baby underwater, and I just wanted a, a water effect. And um, overall, I'd say, you know, a real large percentage of that was exactly how I thought of it in my mind. And, but he came up with the idea of the, um, the actual set, you know, with the stairs and, and the chandelier and stuff. And it just, it just worked out perfectly. I mean, it's really good. It's great to work with somebody that can come up with their own ideas too and just surprise you you know and then and not only come up with the same exact vision that you had translate that and then throw in their own ideas and that works even better because then you have more things to work with you know what, what was yours and what was his do you remember what you suggested and some of the things he surprised you with well he basically just came up with the set the, the stairs and um the chandelier, the set itself, yeah. How long did you have to swing from the chandelier? Mm, quite a few hours, <laughs> yeah. Um, and lithium was originally going to be a, a pretty elaborate, I don't know, I guess concept video with some, some pretty elaborate ideas you had for it, right? Yeah, it's just that we, we failed to hire um, some some puppet people, I, I guess that's what you'd call them, people who, who do animation and, and use puppets in time to be able to finish it, to, to get it out in time, the release date. 
So we just scrapped the idea. Actually, we just put it on hold, and um, we're still working on it. We, we still want to do something with puppets. Um, at, at the time, I wanted pretty much a, a, a rip off of the Brothers Quay. You know, not a rip off, but you know, using the same imagery. But um, because I, I make dolls, I've been making dolls for years, and it just turns out that those are the dolls that I make are a lot like Brothers Quay dolls that they use. And when I first saw their short films, I was just amazed. It's like, God, this is the neatest thing I've ever seen. You know, that's my mind, you know? And um, it was just, um, you know, it was just put on the back burner. But we're still working on it. That'd be cool. Have you seen that Tool video? You know, I, oh God, I hope they get sued. You did a great job ripping them off, but it is so... It is such a rip-off. Yeah. It's, it's a shameless rip-off. Yeah. I mean, I wanted a Brothers Quay style, but I didn't want anything like that, you know. That, that was terrible. I mean, it, it's a neat video. It's really nice to look at, but I mean, I'd rather watch a Brothers Quay video, you know. Yeah, I mean, even, even down to, like, stuff coming through windows on walls that you can yeah. see. Yeah, so, meat uh, going through tubes and, yeah. I mean, pipes and, oh, shameless. Yeah. You'd be slapped on the wrist for that. Um, and can you? I mean, no, no one's ever going to hear what I'm saying, actually. So if you can just kind of explain how the the idea for In Bloom came up and, and who that is doing the Ed Sullivan bit. You know. Oh, who is the the guy that? Yeah. Oh, that's that's Doug Llewellyn. The guy in the In Bloom video is Doug Llewellyn from the People's Court. He's the MC or whatever you would call him. He's the guy that talks to the people after they win or lose. You know, he interviews them. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was it was my idea to come up with that. I I um, thought I want to do a, I want to do a video that's either from I, I wanted something that looked like it was off of live television from the late fifties or early sixties, and I thought the best way to do it instead of trying to reproduce that effect with new film, I thought, I asked Kevin, are those kinescope cameras still available? And he said, yeah, we can get them in Hollywood. You can get anything in Hollywood. So it just worked out perfectly. I didn't think we'd ever be able to actually find those kind of cameras, but we did. And that's another video that just came out exactly how I wanted it, just perfectly. Are we out of tape? Is that what you're doing? No, I'm sorry. I was just saying that first part of the answer. Oh, okay. So right. it's like <clears throat> um, was there the other thing that the, the thing that struck me the most about it the first time I saw it was um, some film I've seen of when Elvis was in a lot of trouble for his, his, <coughs> his pelvic thrusting and when they shot him just from the waist up and then he went on Ed Sullivan and Ed pulled him aside and said this is a perfectly nice fella you know and all that and all of a sudden his problems were over and he was okay was that uh. sort of in mind with what was going on with you guys with the three perfectly nice clean cut young men mm. I, no, I don't remember ever seeing that Elvis thing, but I think, God, what was the story about that? I think it was just that I was talking to Kevin about it, and I said that I would like him to say something about how nice and clean cut we are, you know, how perfect we are, because, you know, the In Bloom video came out at the height of us being thought of as degenerates, you know, so, you know, we, we needed a, a light-hearted video. That's why I asked. It seemed like an odd parallel from what I've never seen from the Elvis stuff. Mm. How did you end up doing three versions of it? You were going to do, you had planned on doing two, right? Was there a third one? Well, that, I mean, maybe that's just something I know because I know there was one there. But there's one that's all dresses, there's one that's all in, in the suits and stuff, and then there's, there's the one that's the mix that I guess got played the most. Mm. I don't know anything about the one that was just all suits. I think Kevin wanted to do one with just suits, but we, I never, I've never seen that one. I don't know if he actually made one or not. Because all I know about it is the one with the dresses and the one with both of them. Mm. They probably never made mm. um, Now, was Sliver supposed to, I know that was done in your garage or something? Yeah. Or basement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that, um, I don't know, maybe I'm high thinking this, but I thought I heard somebody that that was supposed to replicate an old um, rehearsal space here or something, or? No, um, it just, it turned out that 
um, it looks a lot like my old apartment in Olympia because I I used um, I had moved all my stuff I had my um, my entire apartment all the stuff from my apartment from Olympia stored in a storage space for the last two years and I brought it up to the house when we moved into Seattle last year and I had all this stuff in the basement and so I set everything up exactly how I had it in my apartment in Olympia it's it it just weird deja vu to see that how did, uh, how did Frances Bean survive that? Was she kinda... that's just that's just um, trickery that's yeah. just we, she wasn't right in the middle of us dancing around and throwing things you know we, we shot us dancing around and then we put her down and then like just drop paper around her yeah. you know and then edited it together to make it look like she was like at our feet <laughs> that just seemed like an obvious thing to do since she was there in the house and stuff. Or was yeah, like she was there. I was babysitting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, when you went to do Heart Shaped Box, did, did you plan on doing that with Kevin? Or was it? did you decide you wanted to go with someone else from that from the beginning? Mm, I'd rather not answer that. Okay, that's cool. Um, did you... Did you um, collaborate with Anton a lot on a lot of the ideas? And actually, how did you... Why Anton? Um, well, we we met him a few months before we, we did the video, or before we decided to do the video. Um, he did a photo shoot for us, and um, he, he was just such a nice guy. And then I saw, I think it was a New Order video, and um, I wanted to work with somebody that was a, a photographer or an artist this time. I just wanted to make sure that the visuals were going to be really stark and vivid. You know, so that's why we chose him. I'm in it for like two minutes once a year. Yeah, he's great. He's a really great guy. Whose idea were the uh, the hanging fetuses and the organ woman and, and Santa across and all this? All of it was my idea, except for the large woman. You know, that was Anton's idea, and that was just another thing that he just threw in. You know, he didn't even we didn't even talk about that. It was just he just happened to film her one day when we weren't there and uh, it was it was incredible I mean it turned out so great uh, like I was saying before it's really great to work with somebody who has their own ideas you know because it, and not only can you translate exactly I mean that that video has come closer to what I've seen in my mind what I've envisioned you know than any other video I, I didn't think it was it would ever be possible to come that close you know it was just perfect I think I've drained myself on video ideas. I don't even want to try to reproduce something like that again. Is it a lot of work for you? A lot of work, yeah. Oh, definitely. It, it's mind-boggling. It's just, um, I don't know, it's just, it's a really detailed medium. It's just, there's so much to it, you know, and it's so, it's so fragile. You know, you could really screw it up. Um, now you're not you're not gonna make a video for all apologies. You're just gonna put me unplugged. I just haven't bothered to come up with any ideas lately. I've been on tour and I just I haven't been thinking of anything other than just concentrating on touring. I, I just don't want to bother with it right now. I don't really see the need to put out more than one or two videos for each record anymore is basically a waste of money because everyone knows we have a record out you know and if we're going to sell some more records based on the next video then those aren't people who want to listen to our album anyhow they bought it because of that video or that song you know and um you know i just want to sell albums to people who really like us and who already know about us and already like us you know so I don't see any reason for it. I actually don't want to do any more videos, but I've got a few ideas for, for Rate Me, and we want to release it as a single, so we, we might do something with that. Do you want to talk about that at all, or do you want to save that for Ah, we'll save it. Yeah. Was, was All Apologies going to be the next single anyway? Because that, I mean, of the, of the Unplugged stuff that I've seen, that's, that's one of the ones that I think fits the Unplugged format the best? Was, was that the reason for it or were you planning on putting it out as a single anyway? No, it was going to be the next single. I don't think it was the best performance off the Unplugged thing. 
but that's just my opinion. I, I, I don't think it was that good, really. We've played that song a lot better before, but, but I see what you mean. It does fit. It could work really well acoustically. Yeah, I, I don't mean that particular form, performance necessarily. I just mean I think if you mm. listen to to the four discs worth of stuff that you've got, that's one of the ones that seems like if, if you hadn't seen you guys do it yet, listening to all of them, it would seem like that'd be one of the, the biggest, most likely candidates. For right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we talked about um, how before how you weren't particularly crazy about the way a, a lot of the, the production ended up for, for Nevermind or something. Did that affect the way you um, went into your utero at all? Um, I think it had a little bit to do with that, yeah. And we just wanted to make sure that it wasn't as commercial or slick sounding. And the main reason is not, it had nothing to do with wanting to alienate people or, you know, it had nothing to do with that. We just wanted to make sure that we put out a record exactly how we want it. We wanted to put out a record that we would listen to at home, you know? And we don't listen to very very many bands that are produced the way Nevermind was produced. Although it is raw by comparison, you know, to most other commercial rock records, you know? It's still, we don't listen to that kind of music, so. I mean, I really can't think of any other band besides R.E.M. that that has that kind of production that I like. You know, so, was that way? You know, something actually that surprised me that I didn't know that Chris said earlier is that you um, actually originally were thinking about Steve Albini for Nevermind. You know? We've been thinking about Steve Albini forever. We've been wanting to have him produce us for since around Bleach. Actually, if we could have if we could have gotten him for Bleach, we would have done that. But we couldn't afford it at the time, I don't think. No, I guess that isn't the right answer. I mean, I, I'm sure Steve has done yeah. bands for nothing, but we just didn't think he would like us at the time or something. I don't know. The first, the first thing that I thought of when I heard that he was producing it was just trying to think of the way you guys sound with Surfer Rosa. And I just thought, like, wow, this is going to be great. Yeah, I mean, that's... That's what I thought too. I just thought it was the perfect sound for us because when I heard Surfer Rosa, I thought that's exactly how I want my band to sound. That's how I've always wanted our band to sound, but we've never been able to capture that sound. You know, it just—it was just a coincidence that 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 um, he he produces records like that. You know, that's what I've heard in my head for years. You know, that that kind of snare drum sound. You know, I think the big and and maybe only. Um criticism that he gets from the records he produces and, and it's odd because the the big black records and the rape man records the vocals are right up there and they're really really loud and they're one of the most prominent things in the records but the criticism that he's gotten is that the vocals are always too low no i agree i think uh, almost every album i've heard him produce that he's produced um it ha always has the vocals too quiet he's not much of a vocal man i don't think and we're a very vocal oriented band, so it was kind of a struggle to get the vocals loud enough for him. So there were, there were discussions about that then? Like, yeah. Really yeah. We we're always asking him to turn the vocals up more. It was kind of a fight. So why was, um, why was Scott Litt brought in for it? It was just the two songs, right? All, all apologies. And yeah. Um, well. They just didn't seem finished. Or it's, they just, I don't know. I mean, we listened to In Utero for about two months after it was finished, after we finished it with, with Albini. And listening to this, the album over and over again, it got a bit redundant. That drum sound is a bit overbearing after a while, and so we didn't want the entire album to sound like that, you know? We, we wanted something different, and um, Scott was available, and, and we love the production of R.E.M. stuff, so we just thought, let's let's try Scott, and it, and it turned out great. I mean, he's one of the greatest people I've ever worked with. I mean, it's so easy to work with. It's, it's I want to do our, we, I think we all want to do our next record with him. Yeah. Um, also, for the first time on this record, um, <coughs> You know, you guys are, are, are officially 
credited in, in officially writing things. I know you guys had always, you came with the sort of the guts of the song and you always built it up and, and sort of put it together as, as you know, a band, but they've, they're they actually credited with, did, did um, Dave come up with the riff or some, Songs of Practice? Mm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he did. He came up with the do, 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 that part and the drum part. He came up with the drum part first and then, and then he came up with the guitar part. But I, I came up with all the other guitar things over the top of it, everything else, the lyrics and singing and everything. You looking at, I hope that happens a little more in the future, or is it? Yeah, sure. I, I'm all open for I'm open for relieving myself of any kind of songwriting. You know, I, I, I'd, I'd be great if Chris and Dave could write more songs. Not too much longer, actually. I don't know. Um, <sighs> what kind of? This is something I asked the other two guys too. But what kind of? I mean, I guess since it has an effect on you, it has an effect on the band. But what kind of um, effect do you think Frances Beans had on on Nirvana? I guess. On the band? Yeah. I mean, she's had, and it sounds strange to say that, but she's had an effect on you, obviously. So, is it? change the way you work at all, and I don't necessarily mean in a bad way, but is it kind of no. alter the way you go about things? Or? Hmm. I don't know how Frances has affected the band, other than um, she amuses everybody backstage when she's on tour with us. Everyone loves to have her around. Um, I don't know, since I haven't had a stomach problem, and I've had a child, and I'm married now, you know, I mean, I'm sure I'm a lot easier to deal with. You know, I'm not as grumpy as I used to be. So, I, I don't know. I just think our morale is at its best right now, you know. It's just everyone just gets along. I mean, we've always gotten along. We've never really fought. I don't think we've ever gotten into a shouting argument with one another. One another. You know, we're pretty passive-aggressive. But now it's now there are no bad thoughts about one another behind each other's backs at all, you know. It's like, I couldn't be happier right now. Dave, Dave was saying he was happy that, that you had one first and everyone else wants to have one now so you can kind of be their guinea pig. First one yeah. <laughs> well, um, good, then they can start babysitting. <laughs> um, so last time, there were no lyrics with Bleach, and last time you waited for the Lithium single. Have you kind of had a change of heart about putting lyrics on, on the record? Yeah, I think I've just become more comfortable with them. I mean, I'm just a bit more proud of them than I always ever have been before. You know. I know, I know you don't like talking about what the songs are about, but is is it important for you so that people can see the lyrics and figure, you know, get their own interpretation? Uh, it was important for me to have everyone read the lyrics of the song because although no one wants to believe in it. To not put very much of my personal life into it. I mean, especially, I especially focused on me. I mean, writing about, I mean, all the crap that's been written about us. I didn't want to be part of this bitching and complaining and being concerned. And it turns out that there may be way too lines in a song here and there that, that could be, I mean, could be thought of as something to my past life, but um, I swear to God, my brother, it's really not that as much as it seems, you know. I, I've read a few reviews, and it's just people went completely overboard, you know. My favorite inside source, you know. So that's, the song is about rape, right? But that one line doesn't mean that that song is about me. It isn't because, it isn't about me being raped by the media or anything certainly isn't, you know, but because that one line is in there, a lot of people have thought that that's what the song is about. Well, it probably wouldn't be completely unfair for people to say that when, when maybe the opening line of the album, I mean, not necessarily about that particular subject, but it seems like you're looking back a little bit on, on, on Nevermind Mania. Oh, on, on, on Sentless Apprentice, yeah. Just those few lines, though, just the first few lines but then the rest of the, the rest of the lyrics don't have anything to do with the band or my my ideas about the band at all do you sometimes take 
from from a couple of different situations or a couple of, couple of different people that have nothing to do with each other in the same song, or is it? Wait a minute. Did I say serve the servants or sentless apprentice? Oh, I meant to say serve the servants. Okay. Want to do that again? Or? Yeah. What was the question again? Um, well, the people, <laughs> what did I say? People, 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 I totally went by me too. I, yeah. But people, I guess, interpreting things as being, you know, from your experiences, and I mean, it, yeah. it can't really okay. be unfair, like, with the opening line of the album. Yeah. Well, serve the servants um, is not about, I mean, the first opening lines that say teenage angst has paid off well, now I'm bored and all, that, that is certainly about, you know, my ideas about grunge rock and, and what I've experienced in the last few years, but the rest of the, the rest of the song isn't about that at all. It completely changes the subject, you know. Paul Westerberg. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can we change Yeah. <coughs> Paul Westerberg was saying once where um, okay. um, so tell us about this book. How did you um how did you get to know Michael Azarad and how the whole what was your book? Oh, he did the Rolling Stone cover story. And um we just thought he said, Do you wanna write a do you want me to write a book? We said, Sure. Go ahead. You just want to sort of clear the air? Yeah, we wanted to clear the air, basically. I mean, I guess that's what I could say. Um, also, there was just so many misconceptions and so many stupid rumors that I we all just got tired of reading about it all the time. So we thought we'd, we'd you know, tell the truth about things. Well, there's a lot of stuff in there in quotes, so it should, yeah, it should yeah. pretty much clear the air. No, John Lydon's finally writing his own book. Really? About the Sex Pistols and everything. That should be interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was very, Michael was very, I had talked to him a couple of months ago, and he was very keen to make sure that it was understood that it was with the cooperation of Nirvana and not the authorized biography. Oh, yeah. I mean, we we had absolutely no control over editing anything. He, he let me read it um, right before it went to print. Um, he stood behind me, looking over my shoulder as I read it, like at four in the morning, you know, till like seven in the morning. He's like, uh. and by that time I was so delirious, I don't even remember what I read. I mean, if there were inaccuracies, I wouldn't have been able to tell him at the time, anyhow. Yeah, but um, that's about as much control as we had over it. When, when you did the cover story with him, I guess actually nothing to do with the actual interview, but the whole the whole T-shirt thing that went on. Did you ever think they'd actually use that photo? T-shirt thing. The the cover of Rolling Stone. With the corporate oh, magazine. Oh, did I think that they would use that photo on the cover? They had no choice because I refused to take my shirt off. Yeah. Well, there was one that was act that they that was worse for them, right? The, uh, the yeah, but I just didn't put it on. I just. Didn't bother to put it on. There were some photos taken, though. I think in Michael's book, the punk rock duck with uh, really dead writing on it. Maybe I did put it on, yeah. But I just wanted to make sure not to like button up my sweater to either wear one of the other, you know, to wear one of the other shirts, and um, and never to take my sunglasses off because I knew if I took my sunglasses off just once, that's the photo they would have used, you know. Uh, that's just one of the tricks I've learned. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Another Paul Westerberg story. They had when when the whole when the replacements broke up and all the Tommy and Paul hate each other rumors were going on. They they made a point to do a photo session of them together. And as a joke, one of them I forget which one of them was got a squirt gun and pointed it to the other one's head. <laughs> and they used that one and took they 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 shot that one. Took about ten other. Actually, took about ten photos of that. Took one without it and used them all without it. So yeah. That's probably a good move. Um. Are you finding it easier, it easier to um, play guitar and sing at the same time now, now that you've got a second guitarist on stage? Yeah, yeah, I do. Although I still, it's, um, I'm still concentrating on playing guitar a lot more than I thought I would. I thought it would relieve me so much that I wouldn't even have to try anymore, and I could screw up notes and it wouldn't matter, but I still hear myself screw up, so I still have to concentrate almost as much as I ever did before, you know, but... It still is a relief. I mean, it, it also just rounds out the sound. 
I think that's the most important thing. The thing that surprised me about it when um, when I knew you'd had the second guitar player in the first I guess it was the Roseland show in New York the first time so I saw you when Big John was playing right that was, mm -hmm. it was before Pat is that I thought you'd be just because I was thinking well now he can concentrate more on singing I was thinking you'd be playing the rhythm parts and they'd be playing the the leads that you play but you're still playing the leads. Hey, shut up. <laughs> Who is that? Oh. <laughs> what was the question now? Um, I just I thought when I when I had heard about having the second guitar player, I assumed you'd stick just with simple rhythm stuff so that you could sing easier, but you're still playing the leads. Yeah. Well, that's because I I know the leads and well, actually I don't. I a lot of times, I mean, even to this day, I still haven't bothered to learn the solo that I recorded on the album. You know, I just play whatever I want, but I, I just still like playing lead guitar sometimes, you know. Can you talk about the two guys? That it was Big John at first, right? From mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't, it was never anything even close to official. We just decided to try him out one day. He'd been our guitar tech for... Um, quite a few months and, and we thought since we like him and that's one of the most important things when you get a new band member you have to like the first the person first and then if they play good music then that's second you know but um, it's just um, something we've been wanting for a while you know and uh, it just didn't work out with John really I mean he tunes guitars too good so and, you know then we found ourselves without a guitar tech so is that so is Pat going to be an official member of Nirvana now then, or is he just going to tour with it? I don't know. Yeah. We haven't tried to write any songs together yet. Um, I'd like him to be, actually. I mean, he's so so much fun to be around. Um, and it's just been so great being on tour with him, you know. Um, I'd like it to be a reality, but who knows. Um, how annoying is it after all this time to, uh, to still be, I mean, I know writing for 120 minutes and putting that show together every week. If we get a new video in, either from a new band that's from Seattle or a band that's been around for a while, I almost don't want to say they're from Seattle at this point, because at that, at that point, you know, someone's just going to... There's no reason to. Video. I mean, everyone... Well, I mean, you know, if a band's from Boston or a band's from somewhere down the south, you want to say this is where they're from and whatever, but I just oh, don't want to okay. do it. Because I feel like I'm, I'm con you know, not condemning them, but people are going to prejudge them so much at this point. How, how annoying has that gotten in the whole, you know, you're a grunge band from Seattle thing? Do you think bands will, how long do you think it'll be before bands can come out of here and be prejudged? Probably never. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, haven't been, I haven't thought about that for a long time. It, it doesn't affect us anymore, so I don't really think about it. I mean, I'm sure it's a curse to a lot of other bands. You know, new bands starting out who are from Seattle. You know, it's probably an embarrassment for some people, but I don't know. Um, you know, this is something that I actually know very little about, um, but I wanted to ask you about the record that you did with William S. Burroughs. What was, what was that like? How that, how that come about? What was that like? It, it was a long distance recording. Um, he had. He had recorded his vocals, and then um, a few weeks later, at the last minute, I decided to record my guitar parts. I, basically, it's what I did. I just went into Dave's friend's studio, and, and he pushed the he pushed the play button on the DAP machine, and I just masturbated for 20 minutes, and and then I just sent it to them and let them edit it and put it together, you know. But um, so it wasn't a, an album that we did together you know, technically, you know, so, but then I did get to meet him on this tour just, just about a month ago when we were in Kansas, cool. and that was a great thrill, yeah. it was incredible. Did he say anything about what you'd played for the record? Yeah, he said, good job, yeah, I liked it. So it's, so it's like a William S. Burroughs record with music by Kurt Cobain, on the center or sort of a, mm. I, I like to think of it as that. Yeah. But that's really not how it's titled. I mean, um, I think the record company that put it out likes to use both of our names, you know, equally, just to sell as many as they can, probably. But yeah, I, I think of it as you know because it's based on his story, and I'm just doing an accompaniment, you know. Yeah, I think that's.
That's it. Yeah. That is it. Thank you. All right. Let's shut up the mighty.